This is a map of Raja Ampat. Raja Ampat is in Indonesia, off the coast of Papua New Guinea, not very far from Australia. From where I live in the central part of the United States, it takes five airplane rides, a two-hour boat ride, and an hour bus ride to get to Raja Ampat. It's very far away, but it isn't remote, as I'm going to share with you today. I no longer think that there is any part of our planet that we consider remote. There are thousands of reasons to take those five planes and boat ride and bus ride to get to Raja Ampat. There are over 1,700 species of fish that live there. Six out of seven of all the species of sea turtles live in Raja Ampat. Over 30 marine mammals. So that includes manta rays, eagle rays, whales like humpbacks. It includes wobegong sharks. It includes dugongs, which are the Pacific version of a manatee. So there are thousands of reasons to go there, but my reason for being very excited to go to Raja Ampat was because 80% of the species of hard corals that live in the world live there. And I was surprised when I went to Raja Ampat and dove the first day that there were fields of dead coral. So in this amazingly biodiverse ecosystem, perhaps one of the most diverse on the planet, there were swaths of dead species. This is what a healthy ecosystem looks like in Raja Ampat. And you can barely see the coral in some places because there are so many fish. And even if you were a coral marine biologist, I think you'd be hard pressed to count all the different species and colors of coral that you see there. But my experience was that it wasn't all beautiful, colorful corals, happy fish, and fabulous sea turtles. And when I saw those swaths of dead coral, I asked to be introduced to an organization there that's doing restoration underwater. It's like gardening underwater for coral. And the organization blew me away. They're called the Sea People. And they started in 2016 as uh, an Australian, a Frenchman, and they learned Indonesian. And working from an old refurbished boat, they went to different villages and met with the village elders, the church leaders, and the villagers themselves, and asked the tough questions. Why, in this beautiful area, am I seeing also fields of dead coral, of coral rubble here? What happened? They didn't make assumptions, they asked questions. This is what coral rubble looks like. It's dead. There is no fish there. There's nothing living there. So that compares to this. Pretty amazing, spectacular difference. So the sea people found that these villagers in Raja Ampat employed a technique called cyanide and dynamite fishing. So cyanide fishing is just as scary and dreadful as it sounds. It's a mixture of cyanide poison, and it's put into a bottle, and underwater, these villagers would just swim underwater without scuba gear, and they would aim the cyanide concoction at fish, and it would stun them. The thought was they could then capture those fish more easily, and they could sell those fish. Well, those fish often were clever and would retreat back into the reef for protection, so the villagers would have to break the reef to extract the fish. Dynamite fishing, even worse. Very simple. Sticks of dynamite are taken and lit and thrown at a place in the reef where they've seen lots of fish, where there's been a lot of activity. Well, the dynamite kills everything in that area. Fish that are edible, fish that are inedible, and it destroys the reef and the reef never comes back. So when the sea people found that this was going on there, they decided that they were going to take action. And they worked together with government agencies. And they were able to expand the area underwater of Marine Park. A marine park is not so different than a national park or a state park. You pay to visit it. And scuba divers like myself pay the villagers. 
And so instead of dynamite fishing or using cyanide fishing, these villagers were able to show their reef to people like myself and, and earn a living that way. My name is Sherry, and I am a scuba diver, an artist, a citizen environmentalist, and I am a crusader for coral. I believe that what the sea people did was an incredibly fabulous and successful approach. They went in and they asked questions. They didn't see dead coral and make an assumption about what that was about. Coral is home to 35% of marine life across the globe, yet it takes up less than 1% of the planet. But 35% of everything that lives in the ocean lives in coral. And yet, 50% of it across the planet is dead. But the sea people didn't assume they knew the reason that the coral was dead. There are many causes. They went in, learned the local dialect, and asked questions about what was happening here. Then they see, they collaborated with the locals. They wound up getting that information and saying, I understand what's going on. Let's see what we can do about it. How do we take action? So with the villagers and with the sea people, they worked with government agencies, and they created a very big marine park that now covers 45% of Raja Ampat's coral reefs and mangroves. Now that's all protected. But if those villagers can't use dynamite and cyanide, they have a marine park, they can earn some money, but what else can they do to make a living? That's how they were dependent on it. Over one billion people on planet Earth, that's B, billion with a B, one billion are dependent on coral reefs for their livelihoods. That means that's fishermen, it is people that extract from coral reefs uh, substances that they're using for medicine, for research for cancer and diabetes. It is resort owners, it is scuba diving operations. They all are dependent, over one billion of us, on the reefs. And 50% of the reefs across the planet are now dead. So asking questions about what's happening in a particular area gave the sea people information to possibly do something about it. This is a picture of some of the restoration that's happening in Raja Ampat. So when the sea people determined that there were swaths that were dead, not by global reasons, but by local reasons, cyanide and dynamite fishing, they invited villagers to learn to scuba dive. And they paid to teach many of the villagers how to use this skill and to go underwater and to see the reef and then to be participating in restoration projects and then eventually in protection. So the sea people will train these villagers. They go underwater and help with the solution. And then the sea people can move on to another village. And those villagers will remain there being paid by the marine park, by scuba divers like myself, to protect the area. And if in, you look at that picture, you can see there's areas of grid in there. The sea people work with very low-tech materials. That's chain link fence, like you might see outside of a school or a public building of some sort. And they go and they find different coral fragments that have broken off that are around the area, and using zip ties, attach those fragments to that chain link fence. So the chain link fence is laid down on top of coral rubble. And after about two years, in many places, you can no longer see the chain link fence because the reef has returned. The coral species have regrown. The sea people have an amazing success rate of 85% of the coral that they outplant has survived. And they have restored over 10,000 hectares, which is 25,000 acres under the water. And that puts them from that little refurbished boat, just a few people, in the top 5% of restoration organizations worldwide. There are a lot of things that we can all do to prevent and to protect protect the environment. My great hero is Sylvia Earle. She's a marine biologist. And she says that we are all inextricably connected to the health of the seas. And without blue, there is no green. And so if we're all connected, then we need to think 
of the world as a global place, as a place that we are all part of, that we are not apart from polar bears, from coral reefs, from rainforests, that we can't just use the ocean as a source of seafood, that we have to assume some stewardship and responsibility for that. Globalization has become a really popular catchphrase, and it means the transmission of ideas, of values, and goods across borders. And I know there's very many positive effects of globalization. For instance, where I live in the middle of the country, in the dead of winter, I can get fresh avocados. Thank you, globalization. This morning, many of you might have had a delicious cup of coffee from a coffee republic nowhere near here. Thank you, globalization. And tonight, you might want to research some of the topics you're going to hear about today or learn more about videos that are streamed from countries you've never even been to. Another positive impact of globalization. But there are many negative factors of globalization as well. And that includes carbon emissions. So power plants that are coal-fueled, for instance, will release emissions into the atmosphere. But the atmosphere isn't static, and those emissions will travel along currents of air, eventually covering swaths of our beautiful planet. Or plastic, produced here, and consumed here in the United States, is often put into the ocean as a way of getting rid of that plastic, getting rid of that plastic. Well, that plastic doesn't just stay where it's put. It moves, it transmigrates all across the surfaces of the ocean on currents. And in fact, there were days that I was in Raja Ampat, and you might have heard of the Great Pacific Plastic Garbage Patch, which is bigger than some states. Part of it broke off and moved along ocean currents over to Raja Ampat, where it obscured the light for critters below, and it made it impossible to dive through the garbage, through the plastic. So though it's a very far away place, it really isn't remote. It's being impacted by things that we do, we use, we get rid of right here. So there are many things that we can do about climate action. Jane Goodall, who is a fabulous anthropologist, a storyteller, um, an activist, she believes that there's just a very small window left for us to take action before we experience global climate catastrophe. She says, and I quote, that every individual matters. Every individual has something to contribute. Every individual can make a difference. So if that's the case, I beg you to think, what are the actions that you might take? <clears throat> my act, my A, C, T, was to learn to scuba dive. I've been an ocean lover my whole life, and when I started scuba diving, I saw swaths of dead coral, and I learned to do coral restoration. So maybe this inspires you, and you might want to learn to scuba dive and come with me on one of my restoration trips. Or maybe the ocean isn't your thing, and you have a garden, and if you grow an organic garden, you can use that as a place to sequester carbon from the atmosphere, actually helping the planet and making delicious food from your family. You could attend a TEDx event like this and learn about different topics and different ways to advocate and participate in change. You could write to your elected officials and ask them to support initiatives for climate action. Maybe none of these things inspire you, but you'd like to give money Find an organization that speaks to you about the climate and make a contribution. Now, in 1970, on that very first Earth Day, we had seen that year Lake Erie, one of the largest freshwater bodies in the world, catch fire. It caught fire over 12 times. Maybe some of you remember seeing that in the news. It was horrific pictures of lakes on fire. There was something called red tide that was experienced along coastlines and killed many, many ocean and coastal critters. And there was smog. In those days, we didn't realize it was pollution. We called it something more gentle, which was smog. But it obscured views of entire metropolitan areas. So many of us 
20 million of us on Earth Day. 1970, I took to the streets. And in fact, you can see me, I'm the one with the dark hair. <laughs> so we took to the streets to protest the environmental destruction that we saw. And later, that very same year, the Environmental Protection Agency was formed. And following that, the Clean Water Act was instituted. So those protests really had an impact. So you could do that for climate issues that matter to you now. This is a picture of the Earth as seen from space. And back in the day of the first Earth Day, it was a new image. We hadn't really seen the Earth from that vantage point before. We hadn't seen what a blue planet it was. So when I invite you to look at that and remember that we are all part of that beautiful blue globe planet, that globalization is a real thing, that we're interconnected. And we can make conscious, thoughtful choices about how we care for the environment, how we care for each other, the places that we live, and that we each can A period, C period, T. We can ask questions, we can collaborate, and we can take action while that window is still open to have positive climate solutions. Thank you.